Welcome. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And this is James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. And we welcome you back to another episode of New World Next Week that we're calling our Selections Special. I believe, James, it was a couple of years ago we did a, a U.S. Presidential Selections Special. And as you proposed, and I remembered and I thought this week as I was flipping through the newspapers of the world, there sure are a lot of elections going on around the world. So that is what we're going to focus on on this episode of New World Next Week, which, of course, you can find all the information at newworldnextweek.com. And we'll begin with one from Reuters via the Vancouver Sun. France and Germany on collision course over austerity treaty. Germany and the European Union have warned... Francois Hollande, France's new socialist president, that he will not be permitted to renegotiate a Eurozone austerity treaty despite it being rejected by the French voters. Mr. Holland made renegotiation of the Eurozone's fiscal pact, a treaty signed by 25 EU countries, a central plank in the anti-austerity election campaign that swept him to power on Sunday night. During his victory speech, he declared that France would end the inevitability of austerity, a direct challenge to Germany's drive to enshrine budgetary and debt controls in the EU treaties. Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, flatly ruled out any renegotiation of the fiscal pact treaty Monday, signaling a major political confrontation between Germany and the new French leader. Spokesman for European Commission also said previous agreements between France and the EU were binding despite the election. Mr. Holland is to be sworn in on May 15th, and in talks in Berlin late next week, Mrs. Merkel will remind the new leader that his support for the austerity pact is the condition for European Central Bank support for struggling financial institutions, including French banks. And we'll turn for the second part of our Eurozone crisis to The Guardian. Greek left leader renounces bailout deal. The fate of Greece is in the hands of the leader of a far-left party who launched the quest to form a new government by declaring the country could no longer commit itself to the terms of an international loan agreement keeping its economy afloat. After accepting a mandate to create a multi-party administration following inconclusive elections, Alexis Tsipras sent shockwaves through the financial markets by announcing the pledges Athens had made to secure rescue funds from the EU and the IMF were null and void. Quote, the popular verdict clearly renders the bailout deal null, end quote, said the politician, whose stridently anti-austerity coalition of the radical left known as Syriza, S-Y-R-I-Z-A, sprung the surprise of the weekend's polls, coming in second place with 16.8% of the vote. This is an historic moment for the left and the popular movement and a great responsibility for me. With just three days in which to form a government that would fill the power vacuum that has emerged in Athens, Cyprus said he would begin by approaching other left-wing forces in an attempt to, quote, end the agreements of subservience. The signaling of the loan had been a salvation, not a salvation, but a tragedy, James insisted Cyprus, who at the age of 38 is Greece's youngest frontline politician. That is a lot to encapsulate in, in one piece, but that's a broad overview of, of the situation in the European Union, and of course we see it all around the world, James. Yes, we do, but I think that this, per, these particular examples are a great insight into the dialectic that is at the base of all of these elections and the, uh, the illusion that the voters really have the choice over what's happening and the direction that their countries are heading in, especially when it's in the framework of an overarching regional superstructure like the European Union that's a, a dictatorship in all but name. And it, it's extremely interesting to see the way that voters can be boxed into the uh, into the left-right choice. So you can either choose the uh, the austerity plans of the right or the uh, the socialism of the left, and and that becomes the entire framework through which people see the the debate about the euro. And it completely excludes the neglected third way, which is of course that the eurozone was flawed from its inception. It's a failed concept. It should never have been created. And the only way out is to to take the countries out of it altogether, which was what should have been done in the first place. It should never have happened. Everyone knows of the uh, the Goldman Sachs deal that allowed Greece to fudge their numbers enough to get them into the EU in the first place. So, I mean, the only way out for the Greek people is to get off of the euro and to, to go back to the drachma and to uh, to completely and utterly disentangle themselves from the EU spider web. But, uh, of course, that's not on the table politically because uh, it's just not going to happen through the political process like this. And in the same way, France uh, can turn from a neocon uh, lover like Sarkozy to the, 
I guess, Obama light of Holland, and it's uh, it's what kind of choice is that? Again, France is uh, still very much in the thick of things, and and even this uh, this show that Holland's going to be anti austerity and is going to you know kick back against um, uh, uh, Mercosi as she was called Merkel, um, it's it's all an illusion as well. I mean, to a certain extent, that's hardwired in. So I I doubt France is going to have a fundamental shift in in that regard. And again, it just goes to show that the, the voting process is really just giving people the two sides of the same coin that they can choose, and either way they lose. The only way to win is not to play the game, like in uh, Iceland, for example, which uh, hasn't signed on to the EU, and the people there did some very wise things. Anyway, I'm going to be trying to encapsulate all of this and summarize it in my article for the International Forecaster newsletter this week, which of course is also always going out to my, uh, my own subscribers to CorbettReport.com, so more information at Corbett Report. James II from the Associated Press. Activists mock Syria elections in online videos. Anti-regime activists were quick to spoof Syria's parliamentary elections Monday with a flurry of amateur online videos lampooning a vote they say aims to put a shiny gloss on the authoritarian rule of President Bashar Assad and cover up its fierce crackdown on protesters. In one video, voters line up at a staged polling station and first in line is a man in a white funeral shroud killed by regime forces god have mercy on your soul says an actor playing a reporter before asking him what he thinks of the voting since the anti-assad uprising started in march of 2011 amateur videographers have played a key role in telling their story to the world outside of one of the middle east's most brutal police states uploading daily hundreds of videos of protests, destroyed homes, regime forces, and often bloody bodies of those killed by them. Alongside the serious videos, there's been a steady stream of spoofs showing an often dark humor about the crisis. In recent weeks, the capital, Damascus, has been festooned with election posters advertising candidates. Activists responded with photos of their own, putting up posters nominating the martyrs killed by security forces to the parliament, James. Ah, you gotta love that Orwellian doublespeak, the the amateur videographers. Oh, that's a that's a good way of of putting it. Of course, they'll never actually show the footage of uh, some of those amateur videographers faking the footage that they're uh, that they're portraying to the world as as the uh, gospel truth of what's happening in Syria. But but again, of course, uh, a- anyone who's been following this for any length of time knows the score by now and knows that every single report in the establishment Western-controlled corporate press is using phrases like activists say or or uh, unconfirmed reports uh, are showing, etc., etc. Those phrases are there just to show that all of this is coming from the opposition. They're just taking their, uh, their, their news is coming directly from the opposition's press releases, basically, and they're reporting it as if it's gospel truth. So, so again, here we have the, uh, the election situation, and what clearer example is possible that there is absolutely no, no other possible way that, this, uh, that any type of resolution is being proposed here other than the removal of Assad? I mean, that's the only thing that, uh, that these people want. That's the only thing they're going to keep doing. And the, the international community, which, of course, we know is just more Orwellian cover speak for uh, Washington and uh, Tel Aviv and all of the interests grouped around that, are uh, just licking their chops, uh, waiting for the chance to get involved and to uh, to continue to support the rebel groups, the the insurgency. Um, so so absolutely, this, the the elections are a sham, but only because that's again this is just not on the table politically because it's the outside forces that are controlling what's happening. Once again, this doesn't mean that I'm pro Assad or I think Assad is great. In fact, I don't think there's a government on this planet that I agree with. But uh, but certainly, I I think that it's a it's an impossible situation. And uh, and once again, I mean we can see the spin in the corporate press. It's so obvious uh, what side that they've taken on this that uh, that they're. There's just, I mean, it's a foregone conclusion. I could, I could write these reports in advance uh, because they're just so predictable. James, I had a chance to talk with Malaysian-based journalist and photographer Niall Bowie about the situation in Malaysia and, and abroad. But we can see in, in all of these situations something that we talked about that was called institutional agitation is, you know, who's, who's funding who and who's pushing whose buttons. But I'll throw in a a couple of other election notes from all around the world, from ABC News. In Egypt, low court orders suspension of elections. 
From the Chicago Tribune, Algerian skeptical elections will bring change. And finally, from USA Today, Putin again takes reins of a chain changed and agitated Russia. But we'll wrap up this episode, James, with our world election selections coverage and we'll bring it on home to my home state of West Virginia. Now I'm based here in Portland, Oregon, but I was born and raised in West Virginia and I always have to lament that any time West Virginia makes it to the national news, it's generally not very good news. And even if it is uh, of, of note, there's always some kind of backhanded bit to it. But my, my own personal bias as a side, James, this has been one of probably the biggest stories here in the States today. Inmate wins 40% of the vote against Obama in West Virginia primary, or this man can't vote in West Virginia, but lots of people voted for him. Keith Judd, a.k.a. inmate 11593-051 at the Federal Correctional Facility in Beaumont, Texas, is a modern renaissance man, Rastafarian Christian, former member of something called the Federation of Superheroes, musician, NRA member. His favorite book is Stephen King's The Stand, favorite president Richard Nixon. And on Tuesday night, he notched 41% of the vote in West Virginia's Democratic presidential primary, carrying eight counties despite being incarcerated more than 1,000 miles away. Judd is an ostensible crazy person who passes the time in federal prison serving a 210-month sentence for extortion and won't get out until next year by habitually running for office. Getting on the ballot in West Virginia is quite simple. Judd filed a notarized certificate of announcement and paid the $2,500 filing fee. Despite being a federal inmate, James from another state, Judd's protest candidacy racked up 70,000-some votes, crushing President Obama in the heart of West Virginia's coal country. The rebuke to Obama by conservative Democrats isn't entirely surprising. Obama was trounced by Hillary in 2008, but it is an embarrassment for the president that underscores his weakness in rural Appalachia. According to reports, Judd, who would not be eligible to vote in West Virginia, as in 16 other states, until he finishes his prison term and is no longer on parole or probation, qualifies for a delegate at this summer's National Democratic Convention on the strength of his showing. Unsurprisingly, a call to West Virginia's Democratic Party headquarters was not immediately returned. James. Uh, oh, sorry, I must have dozed off there. Um, wow, I hope someone will uh, wake me up when the uh, the U.S. presidential selection race is over. Um, it's um, a long one. It gets longer every time. It just it kind of expands and seems interminable. Yeah, it's a point that uh, Glenn Greenwald often makes, and I agree with him that uh, the, ele- the selection process is now an 18-month-long political sideshow distraction, which means that any serious issue that actually goes to the heart of U.S. electoral politics, gets sidelined for these ridiculous sideshows. I, this would be a great story if if it represented people truly rebuking Obama for all of the, the incredibly horrible things that he's done during his administration and being a continuation of the Bush administration and that two-headed beast hydra that is the two-party dictatorship that's running America. But I think we both know that's not fundamentally what this is about and we both know how this story is going to be spun uh in terms of oh well look at those appellations wonder why they're voting for that white man against obama we all know how that's going to to be spun out in the corporate press so absolutely it's uh it's just more distraction sideshow etc um romney obama robama Oh, Romney, whatever you want to call it, that two-headed beast is going to win this election and the selection. And once again, the electoral process, I don't think is going to be the answer. Sir. James, as we wrap this episode up, we do have a few programming notes to make. This will be our last New World next week for the month of May, if I'm correct. That should be it, yeah. And I will be taking the reins of Corbett Report Radio Thursday nights, expanding our Food World Order episodes and and covering Food World Order issues for for the entire hour for those three weeks, the rest of May, James. Absolutely. So, yes, once again, thank you, James, for doing that. Uh, And there will be guest hosts every night of the week on Corbett Report Radio for the remainder of the month. Uh, different guests each night with James Evan Pilato on Thursday nights. So I certainly hope people will be tuning in for that. And of course, as I've said, there will be no videos or interviews or articles or podcast episodes coming up. We are out of time, my friend. You stay safe. Thank you. you. Bye-bye.